Attention Baker shoppers. This flu season, why make an extra stop when a world of care is right in store? Get your free flu vaccine from a licensed pharmacist at our award-winning pharmacy. Let our family protect your family with a free flu shot. It's all here. Bakers, a world of care is in store. Flu vaccines are covered by most insurance plans and are free to the recipient. Check with your plan. Services and availability vary by location. Age and other restrictions may apply. Visit the pharmacy or site for details. This is a St. Jude moment. Ashton was a high-level athlete. And in a, an instant, your world flips. And your healthy five-year-old competitive cheerleader has a brain tumor. And the physician was like, your best option is St. Jude. Receiving treatment that was life-saving for our child and knowing that that treatment would be of no cost to us was a huge weight lifted. Learn more at stjude.org. Now more than ever, it's important to take care of the investment that takes care of you, your vehicle. And there's no place better for changing old parts for new than your neighborhood Jiffy Lube. From routine oil changes to new brakes and tires, you can help avoid costly repair bills down the road with a quick visit to Jiffy Lube. You never need an appointment, and Jiffy Lube offers state inspections seven days a week and proudly features Pennzoil, not just oil, Pennzoil. Hello, it's Paul Gilmartin from the Mental Illness Happy Hour. And uh, guess what? You're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to the Storyworthy Podcast. Here are your hosts, Christine Blackburn and Hannah Stinney. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm here with Hannah Spinney, and we're coming to you from the Memorial Union Terrace at the University of Wisconsin, overlooking beautiful Lake Mendota. And now, is did you go to school there? Yes. This is where I... Our topic is the 1980s, and I spent a lot of the 1980s at the Memorial overlooking Lake Mendota eating Babcock ice cream. This is one of the most beautiful buildings in the most beautiful setting that you've ever seen. Have you ever seen the movie Back to School with Rodney Dangerfield? Sure, of course. That's where it was shot at the University of Wisconsin. Really? And there are several scenes that take place at the Memorial Union. And that, when I think of that, I always think of him in that jacuzzi with the young co <laughs> Yes, that was done perhaps back in Hollywood. Uh, we don't care for that kind of behavior in Wisconsin. Yeah, right. Uh, all right, you guys. So yeah, our topic tonight is the 1980s. And <laughs> Dude. It, the topic came from Paul Gilmartin, our guest tonight. Now, he looks like he was perhaps born in 1991, so I don't understand how. <laughs> of course, I do need to have my glasses checked. But Listen, that he would remember the 1980s is amazing to I me. have to tell you something, Hannes. I am a huge Paul Gilmartin fan, and I have been for a long, long time. Now, a lot of people know him as a stand-up comedian, of course. And also, he was the host of Dinner and a Movie for like... You know, I think it was like a 16-year run. I mean, it was a long run. Yes, Um, it was actually started in 1840, (laughs) and then it was interrupted. He served in the Civil War. Dinner in a movie was very, you know, it was, now that was a thing of the 90s, really, wasn't it? Well, that was, uh, and that was, uh, But it was the the first time they they put together, you know, the kind of interstitial. Well, the the kind of interstitial where, where, you know, they were cooking, and it was improv, and they were kind of doing it all together. Right, right. It was the show that your show on USA Network wanted to be. Right. We, I did a show called Ready for the Weekend. Yeah, but we weren't cooking. We were getting ready for the weekend, Hannes. Right. Hey, here's a weekend idea. Why not plant an avocado tree? Yeah. They were like the stupidest ideas <laughs> because what, what, you're going to plant an avocado tree. First of all, it's not going to take the whole weekend. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, and it was always listen. like, yeah, no, no, no. It was, it was, uh, yeah, or it was, it was watch a like, DVD. Hey, go to Kansas City and uh, <laughs> eat some ribs. Okay, if I happen to be in Kansas City, I will probably eat ribs because they're famous <laughs> for it, but I'm not going to go there for that. And you know what? There are probably ribs every, anywhere else in America I happen to be. Build a small rickshaw out of macaroni and duct tape. It was, yeah. it was sort of things and because like that. You were, and what movie would that be related to? Uh, go to uh, like a 
No, I said I almost said Go Daddy. No, Big Daddy, of course. You know, something Adam Sandler, I'm sure. Sure, yeah. You did more Adam Sandler movies than <laughs> Adam Sandler's wife. You did uh, more Adam Sandler listen, than whatever. Paul Gilmartin, Martin, yes, okay, dinner and a movie. But that's not where he has, sh- I mean, well, yeah, he w- he shined in, in, in that show. He shone, where I believe he's shown the word and shines this. now is in the Mental Illness Happy Hour. Paul Gilmartin's Martin's show, The Mental Illness Happy Hour, is a tremendously great show and really helps a lot of people talking about depression, mental illness, and really just everyday anxiety, which is which is what I like because you can I don't see how anybody can't relate to this program. No, only the uh, you know across the country the the emotionally repressed by which I would say most of the Midwest uh, might be like I don't have any problems <clears throat> and nobody has as many problems as somebody who says I don't have any problems. Yeah, that's the number one person who has problems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so second no, second psychiatrist. <laughs> They're the craziest fucks you will ever meet. Is that true? Psychiatrists and psychologists are out of their fucking minds. Is that right? Yeah. Why do you think they want to like take a handle on it? Oh, Every psychiatrist wow. I've ever taken, you know. God, I never to. thought of it yeah, like that. Yeah, no, they're always the craziest. It's like somebody, your your mom has cancer, you become a cancer researcher. Your mom is crazy, who made you crazy, you become a therapist. Well, then why aren't you a therapist? Uh, I am crazy, but I really am a bad student. So it doesn't work <laughs> out very well. But I'm the second, well, I'm a comedian. So these are your two choices. You can be a therapist. Or, you or, or an entertainer. Well, and you know, you always do give good advice, actually, Hannes. You're very good. That's right. I'm at, great. Uh, See, aren't I the greatest amateur therapist in the are. world? And I'm out of my fucking mind. I don't think you're out of your mind. I don't. Uh, but anyway, so Paul Gilmartin What is about here. me? And Red he Room. brings forth the topic uh, 1980s. But before we do that, I did want to mention to the folks out there that if they'd like to support the show, and of course they do. Yeah, you go to the story where the podcast.com and you click on the donate button and you give us money directly. Or you can click on the Amazon banner and then just buy whatever you want at Amazon and we get a little taste. And we do have that monthly uh, donation button now, which really helps out. So if you want to give us five bucks a month, we call that a worthy donation. Mm-hmm. That'd be great. If you want to give us 10 bucks a month, well, guess what we call that, Hannes? A story worthy donation. That's exactly right. And then for those people who want to give us $20 a month, we call that. Mentally ill donation. No. The, be- <laughs> the best of story worthy. But look, really, folks, it helps us what out. What about $50 a month? Each and every dime really helps out the show. And, of course, we yeah. want to keep them coming to you. Yeah, so, seriously. You're getting you. this for free. Are you not, are you not entertained? Here's Send the us thing. a couple of dollars. Here's the thing in the 1980s. That's, that's when I, you know, I graduated high school in the 1980s, and then I graduated college in the 1980s. And, and then I got my first real job in the 1980s. So it was very much like a moving forward decade Yeah, for it's me. all big for you. It was it's a, your big it was decade. A, it was a big decade. Decade. Hence the fact that you are still wearing parachute pants. I <laughs> I became a flight attendant actually in 89, the late 80s. Uh, that was in the good old days of flying, which weren't that great. But pre-9-11, I think it was all you yeah. know, a better time to fly. But when I think about the 1980s, I, I go right to the context of music. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. really any decade. Well, also, it, you just happen to, to be in the right. I mean, that's also... <laughs> People anywhere from 20 to 30, whatever they heard, that's their music right. for the rest of their lives. Guess what happened in 1982, Honest? You know what happened in 1982? Lost your virginity? Michael Jack. That's true. Good call, wow, Honest. Did I? Oh, I totally. I think it was 81, to tell you the truth. But the point is this 1982 brought Michael Jackson's thriller. Thriller. And that, I can't even believe that was over 30 years ago now. Uh, but that was, of course, the best selling album of all time. And then Madonna got really big. Now, kids, I want to explain. An album yeah. was a piece of vinyl that you would purchase but, at a store physically. But then Madonna okay. got really big with like Like a Virgin, and then she did Like a Prayer, right? Yes. And then MTV came along in 81. Right. And then it was like Whitney Houston and Prince. Right. But I liked the rock and roll. So it was like Right. A, you didn't like then, the, a pop. You wanted I more did not Eric. Like I mean, pop. Uh, uh, Young, Neil Young. Neil you Young. Loved Neil I Young. was into Pretenders. Bruce Springsteen was fucking huge in the 80s. Born in the USA was 83. I mean, that was like he was at the top of the game. Tom I work Petty. Tom down Petty. in the car wash. Where all it ever does is rain. That's my favorite Bruce Springsteen lyric. It's from an obscure song of his. What's I work in a car wash where all it ever does is rain. It's the greatest depressed lyric I've ever heard in my life. What is the name of that song? Uh, car wash death? No. Um, I forget the name. It's on It's on uh, d- uh, Born in the USA. Really? That was my favorite song. It's like I picked, That's how crazy I am. I picked out the most depressing song on his Listen, hit the whole album, album no one else heard. The whole album Nebraska was pretty darn depressing. Yeah, that's pretty bad. I want to get right down to it. it, but it was very good also. But then I was into like, um, 
Joan Jett, she was big then. Ricky Lee Jones was big yeah. then. Um, Tracy Chapman, Tori Amos, Nancy Griffith, who I still adore. Wait, who was the one who did uh, uh, We Are Young? Love is a Battlefield. Was that Joan Jett? That was Pat Benatar, wasn't it? Pat Benatar. Now so. you're talking. Oh, you uh, left her that off was your more, list. Because of... that was more in the 70s, I think. No, 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 and it was no, eight, no, more no, 80s. no. That's totally the same time. Yeah, you're right. Big you're giant right. hair, one glove, and no then, fingers, right, right, a lot right. of lace. And then there was a lot of arena rock, remember? So it was like Styx and Journey. Styx. Ario Speedwagon. Aerosmith. I saw Aerosmith in 82, right? The, it was a band that they opened. They were 70 years old the, then. The band that opened for them was called Rose Tattoo, and uh, they were very good. Then when Aerosmith finally took the stage, Steven Tyler was so messed up. He was so, I don't know what was going on, drugged out, I guess. I don't know. He couldn't sing, and he kept the microphone out to the crowd to sing all the songs. The, the whole show. <laughs> the it was like the show. worst show you could That's ever awesome. see. By the way, I want to tell you, this is, okay, I'm, this is the quintessential 80s concert that I went to when I didn't go to very many, but I would go to Summerfest in Milwaukee. Oh, that's And at a big the big thing. amphitheater, yeah. saw Peter Gabriel. Oh, right, And it was okay. that, the, the, the white album where it was like uh, Sledgehammer. It was called and, So. Yeah, right. that, Although, was, that was the album he was um So promoting. was the first one. So was the one when he did, it uh, was like Red Rain and Big Time. And yeah, then Red the Rain. next album was Us, and I think that was Sledgehammer. No, no, no. Or no, was Red Rain. One? I remember him singing that, and I'm thinking, this is boring. Look at, th- oh, are you fucking kidding me? I was stupid. You're killing me. Look, the very last thing I wrote on this page, I saw the Peter Gabriel album, uh, the concert, So, in 1986. Yeah, yeah, I saw the same concert in, in Milwaukee, mind. and he, like, he did the thing where he'd jump in the audience and be pulled across. Right, he And by the surf. time he got back, he didn't have a shirt on. Oh. We apparently stripped him of his shirt wow, in the crowd. It was very weird. And by the way, pasty Englishman. That the girls were not like, oh my, shirts off. We we're all like, whoa, dude. Okay, Peter all right. Gabriel had a small window of quite of, of hotness. He was hot. There was a there was a window there. He was thin. He wasn't hot, but he was relatively thin. Look, and I'm he a was girl. I'll talented. tell you. I'll tell you now. He was hot. Okay, but he has become. Uh, he now looks like James Spader in the Blacklist. <laughs> He's fat and bald, and his head is shaved. It is interesting. He did gain a lot of weight. That is a reference, by the way. Nobody, the blacklist will probably be canceled by the time this airs. <laughs> Such a terrible show. Uh, all right, and then just to sum up the '80s to me uh, regarding music, the arena rock, right? It got it got taken over by the glam rock, right? Honest, like Ozzy Osbourne, Judas Priest. Yeah, Motley but that was Crew, a throwback to uh, White Snake, Iron Maiden, Megadeth, yeah. Guns N' Roses. That yeah. was all '80s. Yeah, but some of it was like Ozzy Osbourne was still coming back from the 60s. Like he was. The funny thing is, I remember when like uh, the Rolling Stones came back in the 80s and it was like, oh, they're back. This is the last time you'll ever get to see them. Right. They're there. You know, it's 20 years after they debut and they're still fucking touring. They were at Dodger they, Stadium. Yeah, like they weeks like, cannot stop touring. It's, it's like, like you guys are 110 years old. <laughs> Enough already with the, the touring. When the Eagles, the Eagles did the Hell Freezes Over tour. Because yeah. they always said they'd get back together when Hell Freezes Over. Yeah. And apparently it's quite cold in hell these days. Yes. Uh, all right, you guys. So we have a real storyteller here. And I'll tell you something. I'm very excited, Hannes. Yes. Yes. Because Paul Gilmartin is here. He is here. So Don't folks, you love him? wherever you are, stay tuned because Paul Gilmartin is on his way here. Next week on Storyworthy, we have comedian Mike Schmidt. And I'll be talking about hookers, hamburgers, and having surgery. Next week on Storyworthy. And we're back. We've left the Memorial Union. We're now on Bascom Hill, right under the big statue of Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> we're looking down the hill, and we can see right to the Wisconsin State Capitol, the second tallest domed building in the country deliberately three inches shorter than the dome in Washington. Is that true? It is true. That's good information. I like that. That's good information. I know. I know. I'm full of useless shit. What do you think that dome is made out of? Gold? Uh, No, it's marble. Oh, it's marble. It's granite. I'm sorry. It's granite Granite. on the outside. I think there's marble on the inside. Oh, all right. Well, we'll we'll take it. If you've ever seen a very obscure uh, Keanu Reeves movie called, I think, Cold Fusion, Hmm. uh, it stands in for the U.S. Capitol. Wow. <laughs> we can just edit this whole part out the because po- the, podcast the whole room just went... Just went rrr. Rrr. <laughs> no, no, no. Obscure references, <laughs> podcast gold. That's what I'm All saying. All right, you guys. Paul Gilmartin. 
All right, you guys. Paul Gil Martin is here right now. He is a stand-up comedian, also a podcast host and a television personality. Uh, right now, he is the host and executive producer of the Mental Illness Happy Hour, like I said. And I'm telling you guys, it is an amazing show for everybody. Uh, you can find him at mentalpod.com and also on Twitter at mentalpod. Wherever you are, folks, put your hands together for Paul Gil Martin. <laughs> The year was 1989, and Nancy Reagan's Just Say No anti-drug campaign was in full effect. Weed was getting harder and harder to find and becoming a lot more expensive. I just started supporting myself doing stand-up full-time, and since I only had to work an hour a day, plus another hour or two writing new material and taking care of the business side, I decided I would grow my own weed. Be careful what you wish for. Like most things I do, I either get discouraged immediately and quit or see a ray of light and go full bore. For some reason, I believed I could grow my own pot. Not sure why my self-confidence chose an illegal activity to make a rare appearance, but I was glad to feel inspired. I tried using a fluorescent grow light that couldn't have been more than about 50 watts. I'm not sure what the light was equipped to grow, but it wasn't weed. The seeds I had planted in styrofoam cups barely sprouted, then quickly died. I was in Barbara's bookstore on Wells in Chicago's Old Town neighborhood and found a book on how to grow pot. I soon discovered I needed better equipment, much better equipment. My wife at the time, my girlfriend, was a little nervous, but I assured her everything would be okay. She reminded me that with the new harsher drug sentencing laws, in addition to doing jail time, they could confiscate everything we owned. I reminded her that we didn't own anything. Well, that's not entirely true. In about four days, we would own a valuable light that made free pot. I also felt that being a white college-educated male from the suburbs with no criminal record, even if I was caught, I probably wouldn't see much, if any, jail time. The book suggested buying anywhere from a 250 to 500-watt metal halide or sodium vapor light. What do you think I bought? The 1,000-watt metal halide light arrived. It could easily have been mistaken for the sun. It was gigantic. The bulb alone was the size of a basketball. It gave off so much heat it would roast the plants if they grew too close to it. So I attended to their height by pruning them daily. I set it up on a timer to simulate the shortening of the seasons, which is what triggers the female pot plants to bud and release their sticky THC, and that's the part that gets you high, and the male plants to release their undesirable pollen, which creates seeds when it lands on the sticky female buds. With the new light, I was shocked at how easy it was to now grow pot, and soon our spare bedroom had a half dozen foot high plants. My wife was cautiously happy. I was giddy. I had two things rarely found together, weed and a sense of accomplishment. I set out to do something I knew nothing about and did it. I had made and completed my first adult to-do list and committed my first felony. I was on a roll. The seeds I had planted came from two different strains of pot, some high-end Hawaiian and some low-grade Mexican. For some reason, the Hawaiian didn't grow indoors very well, but the Mexican seeds were thriving and were no longer looking low-grade. But when I cut their light cycle back and they began to bud, I was disappointed. The buds didn't look like the pictures in the book, so I reread the book. The author had stressed that a plant will only be as healthy as its weakest link, light, water, air, soil, nutrients. Well, I knew I had plenty of light, water, and vitamins, The weak link must have been the air it was breathing. CO2 is to plants what oxygen is to us. It's also the bubbles in drinks, so it's widely available. But I still felt nervous buying a tank of it in person. I was sure they knew why I was buying the tank of CO2. I used a fake name and paid cash. Driving home, I checked my rearview mirror. I got the tank home and hooked it up to a timer and a loop of plastic tubing with holes poked in it to disperse the CO2 around the room. My wife didn't like it. It looked like a huge bomb. She was sure it would explode, killing us. I assured her it was safe and then casually mentioned to not spend too much time in there when it's putting out CO2 because you could suffocate. (laughs) I went to bed. I woke up to something out of a comic book. It was like a magic wand had been waved over the plants. They grew more overnight than they had in an entire week. Within three or four days, the buds exploded in size, color, and thickness. They looked like the pictures in the book. The buds were the size of the erection I had looking at them. I inspected the buds through a magnifying glass, marveling at the colored hairs and especially the ridiculous amount of THC, which could be seen in the clear, tiny, bubble-top stalks that held it. 
By then, it was obvious which plants were male and which were female, and I got rid of the males since all they produce is pollen, which makes seeds, and I wanted to grow seedless pot, also known as Sensimelia, the most highly sought-after kind. Harvesting the buds was comical. It was like I had dipped my hands in glue. I could literally press down on a bud with my open palm and pick it up. I hung the branches upside down in our pantry to dry. I must have opened that pantry door a thousand times and just gazed in admiration at my accomplishment. I got a kind of a high just looking at them. The first harvest was probably a quarter pound of the highest grade pot I have ever seen. I would repeat the process every three to four months for the next year. In a case that I needed more reasons to never leave my apartment, Nintendo became popular that year. I would tend to my plants, smoke weed, and play Nintendo, only leaving the apartment to do stand-up, rollerblade with the dog, or get food. I remember looking at the bags of weed in my fridge. I'd pull them out and smell them, examine them. I laughed out loud. I would never run out of pot, ever, and never have to pay another dime for it. That thought boggled my mind. I knew I could escape at any time, forever. I felt at peace. I felt safe. I loved the look on friends' faces when they'd see the plants and the bags of incredibly potent pot that they'd produced. I would open up our crisper drawer and show them the bounty. Their jaws would hit the floor. I felt smart. I felt tough. I got high from the weed, but I also got high from feeling I was impressing people and that they looked, me, looked at me as kind of an outlaw. I felt dangerous and clever. I decided early on that I would never sell any of it. I knew with my addictive personality that if I started to, I would always be trying to outdo my previous sales, and that would get me busted. I also knew that if I were caught, the fact that I'd never sold it would lessen my sentence. I gave away a lot of pot. You can't imagine the look on a stoned person's face when you hand them a free ounce of really good pot in a bone-dry market. I wish I'd taken pictures. Needless to say, I became popular too popular. It got hard to get people to leave our apartment. I guess they didn't want it to look like they were just coming by to get free pot, which most of them were, but I didn't care. I could only smoke so much, and I didn't know what to do with the rest. I just wanted them to leave so I could retreat into the cocoon of weed and Nintendo that I had created. We lived in a four-unit apartment building in Chicago's Lakeview Central neighborhood. Fortunately, I knew the people in the other three units, and they all smoked. If they hadn't, I surely would have been busted from the smell. The potency of the pot was so great that one or two hits of it equaled 10 or 20 hits of regular pot. When the plants were budding, you could smell the unmistakable skunky scent the second you walked in the door to the apartment building on the floor below us. Bees even started hanging around me. One day I opened the door to the grow room and there were 50 bees swarming around the plants. To this day, I have no idea how they got into a completely sealed room. <laughs> My favorite games were, uh, were Mario Brothers and The Legend of Zelda. I would play for hours, not getting up to eat, shower, or even pee, just holding it in, wasted out of my mind, intent on finding Zelda's next hidden treasure, hoping to not be killed by a dragon. I remember one night my wife left around dinner time, did three shows, and came home to me in the exact same spot. I hadn't budged in eight hours. She gently tried to point out how unhealthy this was. I pretended to hear her. My health started to suffer. My back started going out. I'm sure triggered by sitting paranoid and full of pee for hours on end, too focused on Zelda to move. My bladder must look like a weather balloon. I remember the moment I realized I had a problem. I was on the phone with my brother who was annoyed with me about something, and my wife was in the kitchen disappointed about something else. Both were talking to me at the same time, and I suddenly broke down. I hung up the phone with my brother and started to cry. I couldn't take it anymore. The blunt tool of escaping wasn't working anymore. It worked great for a couple of months, then like all addictions, it stopped working and made things worse. It would be years before I could call myself an addict and get help, but I quit smoking pot that day and gave away all my equipment. Years later, I would start smoking pot again, but it was the first time I realized getting something you really, really want isn't always good. Months later, I started going to therapy and soon discovered the relief of a tool that didn't have side effects. It's ironic that I was playing Zelda, which involved exploring a darkened map square by square, illuminating each one, sometimes finding treasure, sometimes something awful like a dragon. I wasn't ready to explore my own dark square in 1989. When I finally did, I discovered huge amounts of pain, rage, guilt, fear, sadness, and despair. An Irish Catholic casserole. 
Many, many times I wanted to die because I truly didn't believe I would ever get through it. Nothing presents the opportunity for growth like pain, and if we avoid getting stuck in its two major trappings, self-pity and self-righteous anger, pain can leave some great things in its wake. Clarity, compassion, humility, vulnerability, trust, and even joy. We wouldn't have a word or even a concept for light if we didn't experience darkness. Most of our actions in life are driven by the feelings at our core, the ones we can't even put into words, the ones that run the show. If we don't go in there and identify them and process them, we will be unconscious slaves to them for the rest of our lives. I have lived in that prison. My core belief was that I didn't matter. If you had stopped me on the street and asked me if I thought I mattered, I would have said yes and thought it was a ridiculous question. But at my core, I didn't feel it. My actions proved it. I had spent my life trying to stand out. I was constantly trying to impress you. I had trouble speaking up for myself, and I didn't think I deserved a better childhood. I began to hang out with people who treated me like I did matter, mostly friends from support groups, and I began to avoid people who didn't. I began to heal. I ran around for years thinking the right achievements would bring me love, and then I would be able to relax and turn my spinning brain off. Turns out what I needed to relax was to just give myself permission to do it. But to give myself permission, I had to believe I'm okay exactly as I am. And to believe I'm okay, I had to experience living through something terrifying, like processing my past and coming out the other side okay. And that could only happen by asking for help. There is no place in the future that is safe from pain. All we have is here, this moment, this little Zelda square. Explore it. It's your map. The universe gave it to you. Wow. That's a beautiful story. I got myself like almost in a trance, like listening to you. That's also known as sleep. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> yeah, no, like, I feel oh, like no, I've I'm smoked just, like, pot. It's awesome. I'm listening and I'm just like agreeing and I'm like, I know, I know. But I feel like that when I listen to your show, Paul, I am often at home just saying like, exactly, exactly. And I find that I'm saying what the guest is saying after what you say, you know what I mean? I think people respond to you similarly because you do make people feel so safe. Thank you. You know, I do try to create a, sa- a safe atmosphere, safe but also fun and entertaining atmosphere with it's the podcast. It's super entertaining. It could be a struggle sometimes if, if the guest doesn't have a good sense of humor and their story is super dark. You know, sometimes I'll inject a joke that another guest might find really funny, but that guest is either too nervous to laugh at it or maybe they don't get it. Or they're in a place where they're not... Ready to laugh. Yeah, because they're thinking about, you know, other things. Yeah. I mean, okay, so... Yeah, but, you know, as I mean, uh, I got, you know, I got crazy running through my family like a river. And it's like, without humor, it's really no fun at all. It's But it can be the greatest source of comedy in the world. Because people think comedy is fun. Like, funny and fun are two different reasons. They're two different words for a reason. Funny is not always fun. Funny is usually terrible. You know what I mean? Yeah, I heard somebody describe comedy one time as socially acceptable aggression. (laughs) <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, right? I like that. Fuck you. <laughs> and and uh, let me ask you, do you still play video games? Uh, a little bit. My two favorites are Plants vs. Zombies and um, <laughs> I guess Scrabble. I don't know if Scrabble doesn't really count as a video game, but those are my two. Yeah. I, Pla- I, I, I need to hear what Plants vs. Zombies is. Oh, it's so addictive. <laughs> and then what system is this on? Uh, I just play it on my iPad. Oh, it's I an see. app. You can play it on your phone or I, on, see. I think on your computer. But the iPad's perfect because you can just point and swipe. Um, yeah, with it. it's you. You're given a grid, and the zombies come at you in rows, and each zombie can be killed by a different kind of plant. So you have to <laughs> strategize which plants in which order you're going to grow them in. So and it's you, a thinking game. Like you have to think it ahead. It is. It is. I suppose you know it, on the scale of intellectual yeah. uh, capability, it's it's not that high. But I love strategy. I love I love. I that love more strategy. Than, yeah. I love like checkers. I'm addicted yeah. to playing checkers. Have you ever played the um, the video game Civilization? No. Oh my God! It should come in a crack pipe. Now is that <laughs> now? See, because the thing is, when I hear video game, I think automatically of like a video play center. You know, like a. You don't need that. You can play on your computer. You can so, play so Civilization. Now, so now, video games is is synonymous with with anywhere. In anywhere, other words, I think phone. I think is that iPad, true? 
Yeah. Right, me. Sean Merrick? What do you think about that? If you say video game, you don't have to have a PlayStation or a Nintendo or whatever. Not anymore. So there are Xbox and PlayStation, so but then there's... you call them apps or... Yeah. Or yeah, I'm still playing game. Candy Crush on Facebook, so, you know, I am way behind the curve. Yeah. You're always playing the same game my daughter is, Hannes, and she's six. Did I, what did I say? I'm exactly. I'm at the level. By the way, your daughter, as she told me the other day, is six and three quarters. I know. She always Something makes you that stop clear. saying after 30. Nobody's like, you know, I'm 60 and three quarters. No yeah. one's ever said no, that. No, you don't life. say that then. Um, okay, so you do play games and stuff on your phone or on your uh, iPad. I do. And sometimes a little excessively. Like if I'm going through something emotionally that is. Um, Uncomfortable. I'll notice. Oh, I played Plants and Zombies for six hours straight. Come on. Oh yeah. I don't have kids. Do you play Scrabble <laughs> with friends? Uh, you know, online. I used to, and I found that it was either because I had played Scrabble a bunch before Words with Friends came out, so I knew all the the words that I don't even know the definition to, but I are know. perfect. You yeah. know, yeah. Xi and I Xu know. and right. And yes. if you get a Z, you got to use it for this. And if you get a Q, you got to use it for that. Yeah. See, I was really into Scrabble too, but then, I mean, I'll just be honest with you guys. It's so easy to cheat. I mean, I'm not saying I'm cheating, but okay. Well, let's you go see. to a, yeah, you go to a website and you say you know good Scrabble words, and you put in the letters you have, and it'll tell you what words it'll tell can you be spelled what the, with. And it. I'm not saying I did that, but I did that, you know. And then it got no fun anymore because I was cheating. <laughs> yeah, I, I love playing it, but I just I enjoy playing against the the computer. I would rather just play with somebody with the board, and I have the one that pivots, so it's really worth it. My my, but see, my like, Scrabble. But I think these games, like the game you're talking about, you're talking about mental illness. Part of that is there's a calming aspect to the repetition. Of games like this. It's kind of like chanting in church. It's like you're doing, you know, we're crushing candy, we're planting things. It's like you turn your your brain is on, but it's not really on, and it's just like you're just listening to Yeah, it's meditative. You're just listening to a rhythm in your head of like must you must put plants killing zombies. You know, it, it, by the way, plants running through your life. So you're good at planting virtual plants That's killing right. zombies and growing real plants. So you've and got when quite I was the green thumb. smoking the plants, I was a zombie. So. And yeah, when exactly. you were talking about all the people that were always hanging out at your house, and I'm thinking, of course they were. Yeah. And it reminded me of the Breaking Bad hangout, you know, when uh, Jesse and all his friends. Are you a Breaking Bad fan oh, or huge, were you? Huge. Right. Yeah. And so Jesse would have all his friends over and it was always a party because he and, had so yeah, much. Yeah, the two guys, Badger. And yeah. the other guy, I've forgotten his name. I love those They're characters. Those, those guys were awesome. And then there's one scene where Jesse takes this girl's hand and takes her upstairs. And you think that he's going to go have sex with her, but he just wants to play video games. He I just remember that. wants a friend. Yeah. In that same episode, now I'm thinking of it, uh, they order in pizzas, but they don't cut the pizzas. And Badger goes on to explain that, you know, they pass the savings on to you. They don't cut the pizza. You cut the pizza. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's less money. And then Jesse's trying to hold this pie. And eat it. very comical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I love, love that. that. And that has that to be show. real because who would think of that? There has to be somewhere in Albuquerque that says, we'll charge you $3 less if we don't have to cut the pizza. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, like, because I would never, like, that would be such an elaborate joke to, like, explain to the Vince Gilligan. You're like, no, 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 this is great. Listen. This thing that never happens where they won't cut a pizza, we'll say that. It's like, all right. So let me ask you, Paul, how did your wife deal with all of this, and how long have you been married? Well, she was a pot smoker. Uh, are you talking about the story itself or just everything in my depression and all well, that? Well, no, just with your wife, because you've been with the same woman for a long yeah, time. Yeah, we have. Um, how long? We Our first date was in December of 87, and we moved in together in October of 88. That is, um, that's really great. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm proud that, that I've stuck it out and she stuck it out because there were many times that um, it, it, it was tenuous. It um, is tenuous. You know, it's difficult living with a person with depression. Or I should say I can only imagine how difficult it must be. And plus, you know, an untreated drug addict and alcoholic. Um, you know, there's three qualities that all addicts have in common. Self-centered, uh, emotionally immature and hypersensitive to criticism. Mm -hmm. So that's who she was living with until I got sober in 2003. Um, and you know, when I, when I apologized to her after being sober for a little while, she said, I know you think I stuck around because I have low self-esteem, but I stuck around because I always knew you were going to become the man that you've become. And it blew me away because I was like, wow, she could see that potential in me that I couldn't see. I thought I was a piece of shit and that I should you know, kill myself. And, um, 
that's a that's a lot of weight to to walk around with. But you know, when you're afraid to ask for help, um, you don't know what else to do when you're afraid of being judged. So it's, she was she was smoking pot at the time, no problem was, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, it wasn't a problem. It wasn't like a moral thing, but she, you know, she didn't abuse it the way I abused it. I, right. I'm not anti-drug or no, anti-alcohol. No, there's plenty of people that drink it, right, smoke yeah, and drink. Yeah, people that can handle it. Sure, sure, I sure. can't handle it. So does your wife smoke? I mean, could do you mind now if she smokes or drinks or does I she don't, not? I, I, don't, uh, I don't necessarily like being around it. Um, you she know, is passed having, out in the next room, by the way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, her having a glass of wine at dinner, that, that doesn't bother me. Um, the smoke in the pot, I always tell her, you know, you know if you're going to smoke, you don't have to go on hide it from me but you know i think it's kind of sweet that if she does she she does you know go do it somewhere else right but it doesn't in other words like but you being a an addict i guess you mm-hmm. say you still are for her she can she can still just do her own thing you don't put oh, it on her at all no. too. I did you, the, f- the first six months of me being sober um i didn't want her to quit but i didn't want to be around it because i still had the obsession to to use and uh, that went away after maybe uh, a couple of months and mm-hmm. then I was like you know I, I just I felt neutral about it it's like I don't want that so would you say that like not smoking pot anymore that was the first addiction you kicked as it were yeah that yeah. was like the first thing. That was the first thing, but then I went back, so I didn't really kick it, but I went back to it after maybe a year. And um, but you didn't go back to growing. You didn't no, go back to no, that no, kind no, of. No, I thing. never did. I never did. Yeah. Um, and then when I quit drinking, I quit smoking pot at the same time. That was in two thousand three. And and so that's been over ten years. Yeah, ten years. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, that's huge. It is huge. It's allowed this other area of my life to blossom. The podcast would absolutely not be possible without it. And I would be in a state of complete freaking out about not being uh, employed. Well, it's so interesting, actually, now that you just said that. Because you come from this stand-up background. So it's very surprising that all of a sudden you're doing this mentally illness, depression kind of a podcast. But in fact, now that you're saying it, since you went through your own struggle and came out the other side, you are able to lend... A, a, an ear in a compassionate way that probably someone who went to school to be a therapist or a, a whatever they are, psych, psychiatrist, uh, would not have, having not been a an addict themselves. Um, you know, I agree with you, and I hope it doesn't sound pompous or arrogant, but my belief is the best therapist is somebody who's walked through a tremendous amount of pain and confusion because they... I think they can have more empathy because they know in their bones what it feels like to not yeah. want to get out of bed. Now, yeah, that, that's a- so interesting, and I don't think that holds true for everything. And I like, in other words, somebody might say, well, you know, I don't have to have had brain surgery to operate on brain surgery. It's right. not like that. But there is something about because it's know, not a cold science, right? You know? Right. It, there's more of an art to it. And yeah, my and favorite when people show, are saying, like, you know, they say, if. You can read in a book. Well, this type of personality does this and does want to get out of bed. But until you've, until you like say you've sat there and gone, I've I see no reason to get out of this bed. And if you don't know that, and there's something when people are telling you their terrible secrets and terrible fears, if you just in a way are very ca- casual about it and go, oh yeah, I've done that. It's like it it's a, it takes the weight off of them. Mm-hmm. Like oh wait a minute, I'm not the only person in the world. It's like oh no, I know hundreds of people have done this. Ab- I'm sorry, absolutely. We'll be- and, and you know the other point I would make too is you know that what worked for you, the way people said things to you that helped you as much as what they said to you. Mm-hmm. So then as a therapist, you have an intuitive sense of how to speak to people and what manner to speak to them. You know, two therapists may know what's an important thing to say mm-hmm. to them, but the person who's lived it may need to know that the the way you say it. There's an empathy behind it. And I've heard that, that it's more important as to how you leave people feeling than Absolutely. to how than what you say to them. Any conversation that you have, you want them to leave feeling like that person made me feel good. Yeah, they made me feel felt and heard. Right. And validated. Right. I love that. I love that. Real quick, how do you think that bee got into the grow room, honestly? I don't know. There was a little, um, like, chim- a window in a chimney, this bizarre, I don't know what, what it was from. The window was shut, so maybe they squeezed their way through that air shaft. Could have come in in, like, a, a, a thing of seeds. Did you, were no. you, you weren't planting the seeds at this point. At no. this point, it was a full-on operation. Full-on operation, and the way you keep Sensimilia growing is you cut shoots off the existing plants, Dip them in, in uh, 
uh, hormone powder and then plant that in vermiculite in a styrofoam cup, put that in a window, and then once that begins to grow, you pull the old plants out of there and put God, this sounds like a lot of work. Well, in in a way, it sounds like a lot of work, and in a way, it sounds like something my daughter in her first grade classroom might have up on the windowsill. Well, you know, your daughter lives in Hollywood, so she's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> once you've done it once it's it's like riding a bike it's really really very simple and yeah. there you have it ladies and gentlemen Paul Go Martin explaining how to grow pot for dummies it's like <laughs> riding a bike <laughs> it's just like do you still rollerblade by the way uh, I play ice hockey, but I I haven't rollerbladed in a long time. Ice hockey. Uh, my ex husband plays ice hockey, and he plays every week. And it's I remember you know him playing late at night. You know the ice time Always. is at eleven thirty, or his ice times at five a.m. on Saturday. What is going on with ice time in California? Because they have to make time for the general public to ice skate and the figure skaters to do their practice, and they know that hockey players tend to be more of a I don't know. It's more of a blue collar kind of a. Are you in a pickup league or? I am. I'm playing a couple. Yeah, good for you, Paul. So where do you go out to the one in 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 Bur- where? Where do you Pickwick, go? The Pickwick and, and one then in there's Burbank, one in pa- and there's one in Panorama City. Yeah, but I've played you know all over down. Yeah, in you'll Col- notice there is City. not one in Beverly Hills or <laughs> Santa Monica. Not. That's the not where the equipment is very expensive. By it the way, is, but it's... you don't really need to buy it again, do you? You just buy it kind of one time. Mm, you you need to buy some piece of it probably every other year, but. Um, no, it's once you if you buy good quality equipment, that piece of equipment should last you at least five years. Right, especially if you're just playing two, three days a week or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Hey, you were born January 9th. That's right. I was born January seventh. You were. Yeah, I can tell you're a Capricorn. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. almost interesting. Always but it's off climbing, by two days. Always climbing. And I think we must be around the same age because you said you graduated and went to college in the eighties. I so graduated I. in eighty three from high school and eighty seven from college. Okay, I'm, for, I'm forty seven. I'm fifty. Graduated in eighty one. Uh huh. There yeah. you go. Yeah. But what you were music? so busy smoking pot, it took you a little longer to get through college. <laughs> what music were you listening I went to? to? I, I went five years. Took the victory lap. Yeah. When right. you were uh, playing Nintendo. What were you um, listening to? A lot of the Beatles, um, Eric Clapton, you know, really kind of boring, but you know, straight you stayed, ahead. I don't think that's boring. I think that, no, see, what was boring to me was the Madonna and Prince and all the pop stuff. I was I never I stuck with that. the rock and roll. No, so, so did I. But I didn't, like, I didn't explore the replacements and kind of other bands. I liked you too, but I didn't I like really explore the outer edges of of music the way I I yeah. did later and it was probably also because I play guitar and I wound up listening to music where I like the guitar solos. Yes, I do, I do that as well, but that's kind of my affinity for the singer-songwriter kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. All my Neil Young fascination because it's all guitar based. That's yeah. where I find my that's what I love as well. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Hey, you want to play some Shotgun Story with me? Sure. Music can only mean one thing. It's time for Shotgun Storyworthy. The game where our storyteller spins the storyworthy wheel of truth and tells a true one-minute story about the topic it lands on. So everybody, say it with me. Spin that wheel! My topic is virginity. And uh, I lost my virginity when I was 18 years old. I was, a, I was a senior. She was a sophomore. And my friend Todd's parents were uh, out of town. And so he said we could use their house. We went in his parents' bathroom. And it was my first time. And so we're laying on the floor of the bathroom. And I put the condom on. And we start having sex. And, you know, up to that point, all I had ever done was masturbated, which, you know, usually only took me about two minutes. And I didn't realize that because the condom decreased the sensation a little bit that it would take longer to orgasm. And so I started panicking. I was like, what is wrong with me? And so at about the five-minute mark, I went, oh, my God, I'm gay. And then I came and went, I guess I'm not. And that's my story. Wow. And you did that story in 50 seconds. Paul, See, that's you like can one... do things in a quick period of time if you have to. <laughs> that was one of my favorite shotgun story worthy stories of all time. And I like the Thank detail you. of like, uh, and my t- friend's parents were out of town. I'm like, oh, God, don't tell me you fucked in their bed. Oh, thank God you did in the bathroom where you can clean the floor. Was off. it good for her? 
I I'm sure she loved I, the cold tile on her back. I don't know, but she was a really, really sweet girl. I just remember and that. Were you dating or was it? We were dating. You were, we dating. were dating. And did you know you were going to do it at that time? Uh, I had the feeling because she had dated a friend of mine and they had had sex. Oh, so And you I would knew. be lying if I said that didn't factor into why I asked her out. So you knew she was loose, as it were. Uh, yeah, I didn't consider it, it, it loose. Um, I, I knew that she would probably you, do it. You considered it awesome. I considered it awesome. Wait, hey. where'd you grow up? Philadelphia. Wait, Chicago. Oh, Chicago, I'm sorry. Yeah. Right, same as Mike Schmidt. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can tell you. Yeah, what part of Chicago did you grow up in? Because I'm from South Milwaukee. Suburbs, Homewood. Homewood. And I've done See, Summerfest, by the when way. When Mike Schmidt was on three weeks ago, or whenever he was in here, I, it's like I said to him, oh, South Side Chicago, you know where Homewood is? He went, yeah, kind of, because I, I went out with a girl at, uh, from Homewood at really? the University of Wisconsin. What, do you remember her name? Uh, Whore McGinty? <laughs> no. <laughs> No, I don't remember her name. Okay. I'm sorry, I don't. And listen, you studied at Second City. Now it's all coming together, I right? Did. Of course, I did. Chicago, Second yeah. City, yes. That's fantastic. I was never a paid performer, but I went through their training program. Right. And yeah, I know you, a lot of people. Evan, Evan, who I've known since the first, first grade, grade Gore, Gore is part yeah. of that. That's his middle name, who I've known since first grade. Yeah. Have you but, done any improv out here in L.A.? I mean, beyond, I know dinner and a movie, of course, but did you ever do like Groundlings or UC, no. UCB or any of those things? No. Uh, I did stand up, and, you know, I do this uh, satirical. A right-wing character that there's a lot of improv involved in that. I go in front of audiences and I take questions. He's a congressman and I take questions about Republican policy and then I uh, oftentimes improvise answers. Um, but many times it's also a, a question I've answered before and I have a sure, joke sure, that sure. I've built uh, but that's very humorous. It, but, you know, that's the closest that I come to, uh, to But during that. dinner in a movie, this... You that know, was improvised. You had... I can't even get over the run you had on that. And how many different co-hosts did you end up having? Three. Three. Three and Annabelle Gerwitz, she's a friend of, of Storyworthy and she's done our show twice and we love her. Yeah, she was my first co-host. And you guys were amazing together, I thought. Oh, thank you. There's still some thank really you. funny sketches you can see on YouTube of the two of you together. Oh, really? Oh, yeah, sure there are. Oh, sure there are. You didn't yeah, you know that? Yeah, you think this stuff goes away, but it doesn't go away. Yeah. Really, Paul, to, yeah. if you ever are having a... I know, I know of one or two, but I, I, I never knew that there was Oh, there's was, some there really cute stuff that. on there, sure. Mm. And then I remember there was a cookbook. There was like there a was book. was great recipes. Claude Mann, who did the food for the show, such a talented chef. And that was one of the greatest perks. You know, there were, we would sit down to eat the meal at the end of the show, and I would just go, I'm getting paid yeah. to eat on television. And make fun of bad movies. This yeah. Is, this is... But there was also a pressure to knowing that um, you know a million people were going to see what you decided to say in the next thirty seconds, and as a you know a perfectionist and somebody who beats themselves up a lot, um, it really fucked with my head a lot. Uh, I used to have to get drunk to watch tape of myself because oh, wow. if I made a mistake, I would just be like, "Oh God, you know you're." You, people hate you. Well, it's easy to put a lot of weight on a television appearance as well because you're seeing visually and then also you're hearing your jokes. So there's like, you know, like when I hear myself on a podcast, if I fuck up, I think, well, it's just my voice really that's fucking up. <laughs> but, you know, on camera, there's a whole nother element. Yeah, you're picking your body apart and mm -hmm. you're, you know. That's it's, very, it's very stressful. Yeah. But it was a great run. Congratulations Thank on that. Thank you. And I'm really, really grateful uh, for it. It, uh, it gave me the the ability to kind of unwind and say, okay, I don't have to worry about the bills for this year. God bless what America, else? man. Yeah. It's what huge. What else can I do? Huge. Yeah. Well, listen, we can't thank you enough for coming on our show today. Try. Yeah, thank you so much, thank you. Paul Okay, Gilmartin. that's enough. That's enough. You okay, are sorry. fantastic, really. And I just love Mental Illness Happy Hour. You guys can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud. And, and can I plug a great website of for course. people that are thinking of getting help and don't know where to begin? Uh, helpguide.org. Helpguide.org. Yeah. Excellent. And that's a great resource for, they direct you in any way you need. Any way, any resource um, that you might have for, you, where if you don't know where to begin to get help, but you just feel fucked up and stuck, go to helpguide.org. Everybody's fucked up. Yeah. There's nobody not fucked up. Yes, but some people aren't stuck. Being that the whole stuck thing is the tricky part, because I was stuck for years. I'm looking around like, everybody else is crazy. Why is this? Why am I seem crazier? Because I'm the same crazy I was five years ago. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't interesting, moved on honest. to a different. Uh, yeah, nothing's actually happened. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, you'd be a good guest, Hannes, on the mental illness happy hour because I Hannes, got. Oh, I got some mental illness to talk. Yeah, about. unfortunately, you do. Oh yeah. Yeah. I got. I mean, the but not you personally. No, 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 no. It's that kind of. You know what I mean, right? So yeah, and I know. My yeah. The problem is my family was so 
fucked up that I appeared to be relatively normal compared to them. But and then, then you get out in the world down, and you're yeah. like, oh, I'm weird too. I had no idea. I thought I was like the, the guy at the center of the sitcom who's boring yeah. and all the crazy neighbors are there. And you're like, oh, wait, I'm a crazy neighbor. Yeah. The what nice the guy in the Nazi party. Yeah, yeah. I'm not Hitler. Yeah. I'm Hitler's barber. Yeah, I'm why blameless. is everybody upset I was a Nazi? Yeah. He was one of the nice guys. Everybody's yeah, I used me. to always, I, I never killed a Jew completely. I would wound them, but you know, no. You know, I feel my pressure, Paul, is of what am I, what, how am I fucking up my daughter now? Like that worries me more than Just accept that whatever you are was, going to in some way. I can't, but I feel like, I feel like we're so close and my finger's so on the pulse of her, you know, like her happy, happy childhood she's having. I mean, she really is. Sometimes I say, Alabama, how's your childhood? She goes, I'm happy, mama. I'm like, right on, you know? Yeah, but in the back of her when she's 18, 14, she'll be thinking, Am I, am I happy? Am God I happy now? Damn, am I, I happy hope now? I'm not am I happy now? Too much bad stuff. But then, I hope not. But then she's going to get to an age when she appreciates what you did, and and will be able to see that you were just a human being. Yeah. And so listening to your show is two part. In one part, I have all this empathy for the person on the show, and I can completely relate in so many ways. And then on the other side, I get to think I'm not that fucked up. Yeah, or, you, you know get what I mean? To judge like, them and be feel superior. And not, that's no, I don't mean to say judging, of it, but I do. I am grateful that I'm not addicted to drugs, or that I'm not, you know, that my child loves yeah, me at least today. You listed today. the three three things of a drug addict, and I was like, I have all three of those things. How come I'm not addicted to anything? But I think I was I was like you know this low self esteem. But it's like since my family, so many people were crazy. I was afraid to make myself crazy by being on drugs. Mm-hmm. I was like I gotta, gotta clamp it down. I gotta no, stay in control no at all times. Right. All control, all control, except for the well, bratwurst. You know, uh, well, you know uh, the, the addiction to control, uh, the codependence can be its own uh, its own addiction. And yeah, they have a lot of the same the same qualities. You know, I think there's about a thousand different things people can be addicted to that aren't readily visible you know power money what yeah people not think. giving off any sense that anything's wrong with you exactly. yeah exactly you can't escape mental illness nobody can yeah or or certainly neuroses neuroses you know all yeah. neurotic people aren't addicts but all addicts are neurotic oh my head's gonna explode right now it's okay. all thank coming you around. so much for coming on our show today my pleasure we sure do appreciate it and on behalf we're gonna wrap it up right about now uh, on now? behalf of now? Sean Merrick here at Sideshow Network and also Jorge Reyes and of course Joe Slepsky and John Thomas Griffith John you know, Thomas Griffith that's the guy that wrote the theme song Hannes follow me yes exactly and on behalf of our storyteller tonight Paul Gilmartin and of course you Hannes Finney my dear friend and co-host my name is Christine Blackburn saying make it a story worthy week Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories. Subscribe to Story Worthy on iTunes and visit the Story Worthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. Caregivers, are you and the person you care for not satisfied with your current home care agency? Then you need to call Help at Home as we offer the highest paid wages, weekly pay, overtime pay, benefits, and do not forget paid time off. Help at Home is actively recruiting caregivers who are caring for a loved one. We make changing agencies quick and easy. Call one of our care professionals now at 412-784-6711. That's 412-784-6711 or go to helpathomepa.com. Jeep Freedom Days are here, where right now, well-qualified returning FCA lessees get a low-mileage lease on the 2022 Grand Cherokee WK Laredo E4x4 for $369 a month for 36 months with $3,799 due at signing. Tax title license extra. No security deposit required. Call 1-888-925-JEEP for details. Requires dealer contribution at least to Chrysler Capital. Lessee is responsible for termination fees. Current lease must end by 7-3-23. Extra charge for miles over $30,000. Residency restrictions apply. Take delivery by 7-5-22. Jeep is a registered trademark.